All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining PFLAG Manhattan Beach's uh, gender expansive support group meeting today. Uh, in today's presentation, we have Ray Resendez, who will be speaking. Uh, Ray is a dedicated advocate to LGBTQ rights. He specializes in needs of trans youth and trans people in the workplace. They support diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives within organizations, schools, and corporate spaces, and create engaging social media content to foster meaningful conversations. Ray's mission is to ensure all transgender and non-binary people feel seen, valued, and empowered to be their authentic selves in all spaces. So thank you, Ray, for joining us, and uh, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much. Uh, lovely to see you all tonight. It is actually pretty late here on the East Coast, but I'm happy to join you all, and I hope to foster a meaningful conversation with you all. So that being said, today's topic is empowering families and supporting trans kids together because it is a collaborative effort, and it's not. We all don't just, uh, kids learn from not just their families, but also the world around them, and we try to foster um, a very supportive environment as much as we can. Let's see. So just a little introduction. So as uh, you heard from my little short bio, my name is Ray Resendez. I use they, he, she pronouns. I'm a transgender and two-spirit activist. I'm a, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging trainer, and also a content creator. I actually started medically transitioning in 2014. So October will be 10 years since I've actually started transitioning. I started at the tender age of 30, not 32, 22 years old, like right after college. <laughs> so let's take a look, uh, just a brief overview, like where life took me and how transitioning became a part of that. So I do want to make this engaging. I don't want to just talk at you. So um, in terms of like, um, I will ask some engaging questions. I just uh, want you all to use the chat if able to and share your thoughts and ideas because I want everyone to learn from each other because that's where we foster a lot of understanding. So let's take a look at like where life took me. So a little overview before college, before all of that, I grew up mostly uh, around like, you know, Hispanic immigrant family. We came to New York when I was very small. We came to New York City from South America. And so on top of being trans, which already is very difficult to navigate on your own, but when you start adding, you know, having immigrant families and parents that don't know what transgender is, much less what gay, lesbian, bisexual people are, it adds extra challenges, especially with the language barriers, because they mostly spoke Spanish. And I tried learning Spanish and English at the same time with very fun, funny Spanglish results. So growing up has been mostly having my parents try to be dismissive. And I tried to find family wherever I could, whether it's in friends, other, uh, you know, adult role models in school, or just trying to do imaginative play throughout my life. So fast forward to college. Um, I did engage in some GSAs, but not too much because I was still very unfamiliar. I grew up pretty, pretty sheltered. So when I got into college and started expanding myself into people saying pronouns, gender identity, sexual orientation, it was just absolutely new to me. And, and it was just fascinated me. And that's where it started my journey of, as soon as I graduated from college, it was like, oh, snap, I'm finding my place in the world trying to find a job and all these things, where does that look like? So after college, I got into an internship at an LGBT center here um, in New York City. It's really, literally just called the center. And so I started helping out with like, you know, getting people through the door, doing some outreach, that kind of thing, you know, get people to the door, talk about their services. And after a while, I kind of just stopped doing that because at that point, you know, financial issues started to become at the forefront. And so I needed to get a job that may not have been involved in things that I was passionate about, but, you know, to put a roof over our head, sometimes we have to do that. So I worked at Target for about three, four years until um, a friend of mine who worked at a nonprofit in gay men's health crisis reached out saying, hey, like, I think you would be very good for this role. And so I applied and I've stepped my foot in the door into nonprofit running a transgender program that I worked from the ground up, you know, talking about, you know, HIV AIDS, uh, training for community leaders to go and spread the word about PrEP, uh, PrEP versus PEP, 
uh, undetectable means undetransmittable, all that jazz, and seeking safety, which is like a manual. And then at some point, I started to feel like I could do more. So in terms of doing more, I started to engage myself in content creation because once I started T, I wanted to share with the world what transitioning looks like when you're not only trans, you're all these other things. You're also autistic. You're also an immigrant. You have parents that were very unfamiliar with it. You were a person of color. You came from a poor family, but you still went to college. So all these different things make up who I am. And one of the things that I stress when I do trainings with corporate space is that we're not just this one thing. Sure, we can talk about trans one-on-one -on -one issues till the cows come home, but until we get the full picture of what someone is, all these other factors play into uh, being trans and can either make it easier to be trans or it can make it exponentially harder than it already is. So after a while, I got into content creation. Um, I was just in it just to document my progress. People started reaching out for like brand collaborations, all those things. So eventually I started to make a little less extra side money on top of like my target, my day job of running a nonprofit program, of just collaborating with many different uh, organizations like National Center for Trans Equality, now Advocates for Trans Equality. They changed their name recently. Bloom, which is a telehealth service that has support groups that help develop their behavioral health curriculum. And I ran their groups for about four years and even trained some of the pre facilitators on their processes and how to facilitate wonderful groups. And now I, um, I, while I still continue to work as an independent contractor, I've moved on to working for, um, well, I usually don't talk about this on social media. I keep this pretty hush hush, but I actually work for the largest healthcare system in the US. I work for NYC Health and Hospitals. So I oversee a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives internally and an external capacity for over 30 plus facilities across New York City boroughs and also um training more than 45,000 employees within such a small team. So that's where my work is leading me right now. As for future goals. I do want to write a book and I would like to do more of these trainings, but for right now, I'm very happy where life has led me. I went from not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life and working at Target to where I am today. And that really just took step by step by step and just like knowing that eventually it was going to be my turn. So that's essentially what how transitioning has helped me and helped me develop myself to my fullest potential. And there's still more to go at the tender age of 32. So storytelling as empowerment, as you all know, like I like to weave storytelling into a lot of messages that I like to see because storytelling has power. All of you have wonderful stories that have power. And so they also have value. So what have I learned in my journey? What have I learned of just sharing that little story together? So what I've learned in my journey is that for Trans kids, trans adults, even in trans teenagers, community support and representation are vital. Transition is unique to every individual, so patience and crucial. And what I mean by that is in terms of kids, they may identify as one way for one week, and then the next week they're like, actually, I want to use these pronouns. Actually, this name didn't really fit me, but I might want to try this. So they're in the experimental phase. You know how kids, like when they get older, they're like, I like this, but I actually like bananas. I know I said I liked apples last week, but listen, I like bananas now. Oh, my favorite color was blue, but now my favorite color is red. So it's the same thing with gender identity and sexual orientation. Like, it's fluid. And even as adults, it may be chances where it actually changes throughout that. We're all constantly transitioning. Not in the same ways, but in different types of lifestyles. We may be transitioning, you know, like when you get out of college, you're transitioning from childhood and teenagehood to adulthood. You're transitioning to get a job. You're transitioning to start a family. You're transitioning into, like, getting married, having a job and, you know, transitioning to having your buying your first house, we're all going through different transitions. And so in this case, when we really boil it down to that way, life is full of transitions. And this is just one of the many transitions one human being can go through. And that leads to my next point. The value of self-advocacy is finding one's voice. Remember, when it comes to trans kids, they're going to be adults eventually. And the sad reality, and this is something that I stress a lot is that you have to give them the tools to advocate on their own because uh, you know you can't protect them from the world forever so the best thing you can do is empowering them with the tools to speak up for themselves because there's going to be moments where you're not going to be next to them to um you know to advocate for them 
So translating my experience to parental support. So I didn't really touch too much about my biological family, but uh, one of the things that I, these are like three things that I wish they did, active listening. I felt like, you know, when my family, when I try to share like how I felt, you know, being a trans man, then being non-binary, being two-spirit, a lot of it was like listening to respond and defend themselves. Like, oh no, you were actually born this way. So like, I don't understand why you could, like why this is such a big deal. <laughs> why surgery was a big deal, why me being on T was a big deal, why, you know, just recently this year, I just had facial mass surgery. I'm actually six months uh, out of surgery. And they, to this day, they still don't know why I did it. But the important thing was, it was for me. <laughs> so encouraging your child to express themselves freely and listening to understand versus listening to respond is absolutely powerful because they will remember those moments. And that leads to providing guidance, connecting them with communities and resources. So just think of this group right here as a resource for all of you. Finding similar spaces specifically for your children is absolutely crucial. And I actually made a little resource guide, which some of the organizations and resources you may be familiar already, but I just wanted to send it to all of you. So those could be like some options. And last but not least, celebrating your child, recognizing and affirming their identity. Even if like yesterday they were a trans masculine person and today they want to identify as a gender, recognizing and affirming them and letting them know it's okay for them to not know right now is absolutely crucial. Knowing that they have the space and freedom to explore can make all the difference. Now, some common challenges. So a lot of this is not necessarily just you know, limited to just trans kids. It's something that uh, happens to trans people of all ages. So, and it actually prevents some people from really coming out of the closet, even though these days more, more and more people are coming out. Not because trans is necessarily a trend, but simply because the, we are seeing that more representation equals it's safer and safer to come out. So one of the common challenges is social acceptance. These are like reasons why people would withhold themselves from coming out for whatever reason. So social acceptance, let's say you have a really big so support system. What if these people reject me? I, I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I can't just be by myself. Like, I don't want to be alone. I want to have someone to talk to, someone to engage with. Mental health. You know, that isolation could lead to, you know, negative mental health outcomes, you know, because having that support system can really make the difference between I can get through these hard times because there will be hard times. Identity exploration, having the freedom, again, this goes back to my last point, having the freedom to explore like what gender means to you and letting them know that it's okay to not get it right the first time because shame and guilt is what leads a lot of people to feel confused and also not know themselves at the right time. And so this goes back to reiterating my strategies, active listening, listening to understand versus learn, listening to react and respond like without thinking, advocacy in schools. For a lot of children, you're going to be the first line of defense for your child they're still learning to grow and trying to find their own voice now there are some very youth activists out there that are having that are really good at advocating for themselves almost to the level a lot of adults and people my age but that is not the case for a lot of people some people really need that develop really into themselves before they can really get to that high level because a lot of those people feel usually get to that level out of necessity or they've been built up by very supportive parents that give them the freedom to let them know that it's okay to say no, it's okay to express themselves, and to let others know that it's not okay to treat them this way. So advocacy in schools, you're going to be the first line of defense, knowing the policies of your schools, um, knowing like what are there in place. And sometimes if there's no policies, you may have to be the first one to advocate for it. Because what most people don't realize is that for every school or every place that caters towards youth, one pair of parents had to step up and lead the way and pave the way for all those other kids. Their kids suffered and they stepped up for their kid so that the other kids who come to those facilities can feel safe and they don't experience the same thing that they do. And last but not least, seeking professional support. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily like a doctor or even like a therapist, but someone like a counselor, finding that point person, whether that's at a school or, um, you know, a camp or 
you know, any other space that your kid may take a part of, like even like just participating in sports. And that's a whole nother conversation that I'm not really going to touch on, but because that right there is another presentation about trans kids. But I will say trans kids belong in sports. Trans people in general just belong in sports. <laughs> Now, creating a safe space at home and beyond. So the home is where you mostly will have most control over. You'll get to control like how like rules are defined in the house, how much of a say your uh, child has in the home, and what your child gets to and gets to not do. So you are the point person for laying those ground rules and making sure those ground rules are enforced, but also letting them know that there is open negotiation with your child. So let's say, for example, um, oh, just out of an uh, example, like bedtime for your child is nine o'clock because they have to go to school the next day. And your child may push back and say, actually, I want to stay up till 930. And instead of saying, no, it's because I said so, you can say like, OK, why do you think I should let you up for an extra 30 minutes? Like, let's have a conversation. Those two things open a dialogue and let them know that they can advocate for themselves. So that's like a first step that you can do to let them know that they can do this with anybody. Remember. The behavior that you put is the behavior that according to model when they get older. So affirmation, again, I'm affirming who they are. Education, not necessarily just for you. It doesn't have to be like a solo thing. You can even invite your child to learn along with you. There's actually wonderful books that I have in the resource guide that I will email to um, the hosts of PFLAG so they can share with all of you books that you can look into. And I think a lot of libraries do have them. And pro tip, if they don't have them, the libraries can actually request them for you. So you don't have to go out and spend that money. And inclusive language. So for example, instead of saying, uh, if you don't know someone's like um, pronouns, you could just say their name or you can even use they, them until you're corrected. So, uh, you know, we, I even teach this in healthcare. Instead of saying, oh, uh, your pa she's ready in the in the waiting room, you could say your pa the patient is waiting in the waiting room, like using very gender neutral language. Because like a lot of times you can't just guess pronouns based on appearance because gender expression doesn't really you know, preclude like what someone's pronouns are. Now that's in the home. Now outside the home is finding and curating social spaces that are safe for your child to indulge in. And again, this goes back to the advocacy piece, advocating for your child. If something seems to go wrong, like someone's misgendering your child or there's kids that's bullying, you have to be that first line of defense. You're gonna be that knight in shining armor for your child. And here are some resources for further explanation. There's actually a lot more on the guide that I actually put together, but here are some books that you may or may not know about, The Transgender Child by Stephanie Brill and Rachel Pepper, Raising Ryland by Hilary Whittington, and of course, organizations. You already know about PFLAG. There's also The Trevor Project. And here's another one that a lot of people don't know of. There's actually a camp you can actually send your kids to learn more about themselves and learn to see uh, other queer and gender expansive kids. And it's like a little camp experience. Like so far uh, from all the people that I've heard, it's a really wonderful experience. So if you're able to, and I think they also have financial aid. So if finances are a barrier, you can also they can also work with you on that. But I think it's a, a beautiful thing to have camps for like queer youth and trans youth to like get together and learn wonderful skills during uh, the summertime. And then there's other long line communities just like this one. There's the gender spectrum and there's a lot of Facebook groups for parents of transgender kids as well. Um, I can't there's way too many to name, but I'm sure if you look up on Facebook search, they'll definitely pop up. And that's all I have right now. I just want to open the floor for everyone to have any questions or any comments or thoughts. What's on your mind? And I do want to reiterate this is a safe space, which means you can ask pretty much most questions. I know that's not the standard for a lot of trans people, but I'm one of those people that will let people ask the craziest questions because I do it for, for my thing is this. I'd rather ask, like, answer those questions than have other people who may not be willing to. There's a lot of trans people who don't want to, but I'm one of those people that you can ask those things. So I open up the floor for everyone.